Well, good morning. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'm sure that uh, Adam's presentation is going to create a lot of questions, so to leave room for that, we'll get, get underway. I'm David Pumphrey. I'm co-director and senior fellow in the Energy and National Security Program. It is really a great pleasure to welcome Adam Siminski here to do this presentation on the International uh, energy outlook. Um, we've worked very closely with Adam for a, a number of years and we're very pleased when he uh, moved into this job as the head of the Energy and Information Administration. He, he brings to it skills and analytical skills that I think are unparalleled and it's done a r really great job in moving forward. The other thing that's really important from our perspective is that after um, two years he has brought back the International Energy Outlook um, one of the, for us, standards for understanding the developments in the international energy world, and it makes a great contribution to our work. We have underway now a major study on the geostrategic implications of changing oil flows, especially with the North American um, energy uh, renaissance, if you will, oil and gas renaissance. And so this will be a very important piece in addition to, to our work. So, Adam, we're very pleased that you're, you're doing that. I think everyone should have gotten a copy of his bio, so I won't go ahead and uh, read through all that. And with no further ado, Adam, if you'd like to get started. Thank you. <laughs> uh, maybe you should save that until after I get done. <laughs> uh, Dave, thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, with the uh, entire uh, CSIS team, John Hamry um, came down and said hello, Frank Perastro, Sarah Ladislaw, um, everybody, Annie Hudson for helping set all this up. Uh, other people that need to be thanked, I think, for the International Energy Outlook. I mean, I, we, you know, we had to, we didn't do this last year uh, for budget reasons. There were some questions about whether we would have the resources to do it all. Uh, we figured out, I think it's international energy statistics is very, very important and uh, are very important. I could have said data. Data is important. And um, so we figured out a way to, uh, to make this happen. Uh, John Conti, uh, Sam Napolitano, and uh, Linda Doman, come on, come on, stand up, stand up. Stand up. <laughs> Uh, John, you know, is the assistant administrator for energy analysis, and Sam Napolitano runs our international uh, energy team, and Linda Doman worked really, really hard on all of this. So uh, the parts that you like, you, you can thank them, and if there are mistakes in here, I'll take credit for those. Uh, so let's uh, talk about uh, some of those key findings. So. In the past, and I'm, I'm going to try not to repeat this every time, this is, I'm going to present our reference case. So the reference case is not really, uh, it, it's, it's the one that it, it includes existing law and regulation. All right, so EIA tries to stay out of the business of forecasting policy changes. Uh, we're supposed to be independent, nonpartisan, and we're supposed to stay out of the policy debate and leave that up to the policymakers. We're supposed to provide the facts that surround and inform the policy debate. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're trying to do that. So let's go through the key findings. Um, we'll probably uh, see uh, an increase of more than half in global uh, energy uh, consumption. GDP rising at 3.6% annually and uh, a 56% increase in world energy use uh, with uh, half of that coming from China and India uh, alone. Uh, I, you know, that, I think that you have to look at this as some people would say that's going to be a problem. I think you have to look at this as good news. This is rising prosperity. Uh, so the, the question is, how do we accommodate rising prosperity uh, and, and still maintain uh, energy security and, and a good environmental um, outlook? Renewable energy and nuclear power, uh, world's fastest growing energy sources, so about 2.5% uh, per year each. Uh, but fossil fuels are still going to be s supplying 80% of the world's energy use uh, in the year 2040. Natural gas is the fastest growing of the fossil fuels, 
and that'll be uh, supported uh, especially by shale gas growth uh, here in America. Uh, coal grows faster than petroleum uh, until after 2030, and then coal slows down in our view as the Chinese economy shifts more towards services and away from manufacturing, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, finally, uh, you know, without further constraints of some type, worldwide energy-related carbon dioxide emissions are uh, projected to increase by not quite half by 2040 from around 31 billion uh, metric tons uh, in 2010 to 45 billion metric tons in 2040. Uh, that, uh, that is going to have to be addressed, I think, in some way. So. Uh, economic activity and population are the main drivers. So the prosperity in China and India, as I said, is rising faster than intensity falls. So those two biggest um, brown and blue lines in the middle there for China and India. So GDP per capita going up very sharply in China and India. Uh, intensity, so that's uh, energy efficiency is improving, but not as rapidly as GDP is rising. And as a consequence, you get a lot of growth uh, in those activities. I said earlier, uh, we believe world GDP will be rising at about 3.6 percent per year, 2.2 uh, percent in the OECD countries, 4.7 uh, percent per year in the non-OECD countries. Uh, lots of differences across regions and, of course, countries. Uh, in, in this outlook. The population growth uh, in China, South Korea, uh, and um, OECD Europe have significantly lower growth rates uh, than in the U.S. and India. So that's kind of an interesting one, U.S. population actually growing uh, faster than a number of other countries where people have traditionally thought about population growing very rapidly. Non-OECD Asia accounting for um, more than half of the increase in the world's energy use. So the blue there is the developed countries, the OECD. Uh, the non-OECD countries are shown in the two green shades with non-OECD Asia in the light green, and that one, of course, uh, growing the fastest. Uh, so the role of the Asian developing economies in the world energy markets is, uh, is a very important one. Non-OECD Asia, uh, they're 60 percent of the total increase in world energy use. As I said earlier, China and India, about half of that, the world increment uh, of that world increment out to 2040. Um, in 2010, China and India uh, combined accounted for nearly 25 percent of world energy consumption, and that number should be up closer to 34 percent or a third of total world energy use uh, in 2040. China's energy demand uh, is likely to be more than double uh, the U.S. number uh, by 2040, so let's take a look at that chart. This focuses in on the impact that China has on world energy consumption. Uh, China, uh, which recently became the world's largest energy consumer, is projected to consume uh, significantly more than the U.S. Uh, as we move out over time. Uh, even though energy use in India more than doubles over the projection, it still uh, will end up being a little bit less than half of the U.S. energy number in 2040. So since 1990, energy consumption in both India and China as a share of total world energy use has increased significantly and together they've accounted for about 10 percent of world energy uh, consumption in 1990, and that number is now up to uh, closer to 25 percent today. How does this look uh, across the different fuels? So here uh, we show the distribution of energy use by um, final consumption uh, across the fuels. Uh, nuclear uh, continuing to grow uh, in, in our uh, forecast. Renewables also, as I said, growing very sharply. Uh, increase in natural gas, 
uh, including a slight increase in market share, uh, market share increases for both renewables and nuclear as well. Uh, coal's market share, despite its growth, goes down a little bit by the end of the forecast period. Uh, and uh, liquids uh, market share also goes down. Uh, all these fuels are growing through a combination of GDP uh, and, uh, and population. Nuclear power and renewable, um, as I said, are the fastest growing fossil fuels, uh, continue to supply uh, a, a huge portion of the world's energy. Uh, oil remains the largest source of energy, but its share of world market marketed energy consumption declines. Um, the growth rate that we see for natural gas is about 1.7 percent per year, and a lot of that uh, is going to be supported by uh, things like LNG production uh, all around the world uh, and shale gas development uh, as well. China largely defines the coal trend line, and that drop towards the end has a lot to do with China, so let's just take a look at some of the factors behind that. Uh, this is industrial sector energy consumption in China. Uh, as you can see, we expect that renewables, natural gas, and liquids will continue to go up, electricity uh, rising, beginning to level off towards the uh, you know, end of the period in 2035 out to 2040. Uh, but coal uh, coming down uh, sometime after uh, the 2030 period and that helps uh, the total uh, energy uh, sector, industrial sector in China, um, taper off. Uh, why? So these are gross output curves. The one on the left is the output curve for iron production, very coal dependent. The chart on the right is output for chemical production, and that's more oil dependent, oil and gas liquids. So these gross output curves explain energy use in the sector. Iron production in China, very coal intensive. The decline in coal use in China's industrial sector in the out years basically represents the shift in China away from a manufacturing economy towards a service economy. Chemicals, on the other hand, are largely petroleum intensive, and it and petroleum tends to still be important even in service-oriented, and chemicals, uh, still very important even in service-oriented economies. Now let's talk a little bit more detail about the liquid fuels markets. Uh, tight supply and demand balances in oil markets mean even in uh, modest actual or anticipated changes in supply or demand conditions to lead, can lead to large uh, movements in oil prices. Uh, did, did everybody get why I said that, that, you know, small shifts can lead to large changes in oil prices? That's for me to be able to say that, no, I can't predict <laughs> gasoline prices, and if they go to $4.50, I didn't do it. <laughs> All right. Now let's talk a little bit about this chart that we have up on the screen. Um, OPEC member countries uh, contribute almost half of the total increase in um, increase, so that's the change in world liquid supplies uh, over the forecast period. So what you see is, is that uh, non-OPEC share of oil is growing faster than OPEC in the period out towards 2020, 2025, uh, then non-OPEC production begins to slow down and OPEC uh, makes up uh, that gap so that uh, OPEC's uh, output and share of global markets begins to rise uh, after a period uh, in the near term where they're under a lot of pressure. Now a lot of that is going to have to do with output of, of overall non-OPEC production and especially what happens with production of, uh, of shale oil uh, in the U.S. Uh, as you know, we just published uh, a, a very thick study of global uh, shale gas and shale oil resources. Uh, we did the shale gas uh, study, so this is a kind of a repeat of the shale gas study from a couple of years ago, but we added oil this time. And uh, in our view, the curves or the take-up that we saw in shale gas 
might not be quite as fast on the oil side uh, as it was uh, for gas. So we're a little bit more skeptic than some out there about how rapidly uh, non-OPEC oil production could climb uh, after uh, 2025. Uh, one of the, uh, the total uh, oil production that we're uh, estimating, if you add those numbers up, uh, there is uh, close to 115 million, you know, it's like, this is, uh, I'm going to, I'm looking at these numbers and they need to add up to something and I'm not quite getting there, but we're going to, so we don't have everything on here, uh, the non-petroleum um, contribution. So down at the bottom, uh, 2 million barrels a day going to roughly 5 million barrels a day of non-petroleum uh, liquids. So that's things like um, uh, biodiesel, ethanol, and, and other uh, ways of achieving uh, liquid fuels. So if you add up the 5 and the 49 and the 62, you're going to get about 115 million barrels a day of oil in 2040. So one of the things that I want to remind everybody is, is that back in 2007, the Wall Street Journal quoted uh, several uh, top oil executives saying projections of oil production over 100 million barrels a day were unrealistic. Um, there were a few that said uh, that uh, peak oil was not just around the corner, and that included uh, EIA's forecast. Now, we were more aggressive back in 2007. We said 118 million barrels a day by 2040. But I don't think that, that this is so much of a supply problem, right? Why, why are we now saying, uh, in, excuse me, the 118 was 2030, so now we're saying 115 and 2040. The difference between those two, I think, has more to do with demand than it does with supply. So I think that that's a very important thing to think about. Um, in the annual energy outlook, which we published in December, and then we did the side cases uh, and published those just, what, John, a, a month and a half ago or so, a couple of months ago, what we said in the, in the annual energy outlook for the United States was that just incorporating the fuel efficiency standard changes that were implemented last year by EPA and NHTSA removed almost a million and a half barrels a day of gasoline demand in the U.S. numbers alone for the year 2030, All right? So uh, what I think we're seeing is through uh, improved um, energy uh, efficiency ratios, and it's not just in, uh, you know, in automobiles, we may see substitution in transportation uh, of natural gas fuels and other things that were achieving uh, a lot of progress on the demand side. There's a lot more that could be done, I would imagine, in, in residential uh, and uh, commercial and in industrial facilities uh, to move that along as well. Okay. So let's uh, now take a look at uh, non-OPEC petroleum supply growth and where it's coming from by country. Uh, the, uh, there, there are five key countries here, Brazil, Canada, Kazakhstan, uh, the United States, and Russia. Uh, the, just looking at this, what I would say is the possibility that a stronger resource uh, assessment or resource base could allow the U.S. numbers to go up uh, is got a reasonable probability. The other thing that I would say is, is that Brazil is going to have to, uh, to, I think, be a little bit better in how they're organizing uh, production uh, activities there in order to, to make this forecast. This is deep water pre-salt in Brazil. It's oil sands in Canada, uh, and it's shale oil in the U.S and a combination of conventional and shale uh, oil possibilities in Russia that drive these numbers. And I'll come back to this uh, in, in a bit with just a bit more detail. If you, if you look at uh, that number that I said was adding up to about 5 um, million barrels a day, that's the non-crude based uh, liquid fuels. Uh, Brazilian and U.S. biofuels and Chinese coal to liquids 
account for almost two-thirds of the total increase in non-petroleum supplies uh, in the forecast out to 2040. Uh, so it's small, but it's increasing. World production of non-petroleum liquids, uh, which in 2010 totaled 1.6 million barrels a day, that was about 2% of total liquids production globally, uh, gets up to not quite, but almost 5 million barrels a day in 2040. Uh, and it'll count then for about 4% of total liquids production. Um, Brazil and the U.S. kind of leading the charge on biofuels. Uh, China uh, doing an awful lot in the coal to liquids area and gutter. Uh, and, uh, and I think maybe the U.S. coming in uh, after gutter uh, on uh, gas to liquids. So uh, one of the uh, other uh, key issues that I think has to be looked at in any kind of long-term uh, energy forecast is production profiles uh, in the uh, Middle East. So these are scenarios that we have for Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. So one thing that, uh, that we thought was impossible for EIA to do was to actually make individual country forecasts for these three countries. So we tried very hard to make individual country forecasts. You know, we'll do one for the U.S. We could try to figure out what we think Canada is going to do. And you saw numbers for Brazil and Russia and so on. Uh, the problem in trying to do that with Iran, uh, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia is that if you go to what we think is potentially possible in those three countries, uh, you get numbers that add up to a total that's incompatible with the overall supply and demand balance for petroleum. So what we did was four scenarios. Uh, one we called past is prologue, and that's that second column there. And on that one, uh, you just want to look at the Saudi number. Uh, if market shares kind of continue as they currently are uh, in these three countries, the Saudis get up to a little over 15 million barrels a day. The second uh, one is Iraq success. So here what we say is, so Iraq manages uh, to move up towards its uh, resource and reserve potential, and in that case, they get up to about 11 million barrels a day. Uh, in the next column, we have Iran. So if Iran can follow the same path as Iraq, then they might, uh, in our scenarios, get up to something uh, like 13, uh, excuse me, 8 million, a little over 8 million uh, barrels a day. So uh, the the range in this is, uh, is very high. So as you see in that, that final column, um, there's a upside and downside within this scenario for Saudi Arabia of almost 10 million barrels a day, uh, 4 million barrels a day for Iran, and almost 8 million barrels a day for Iraq. So the Iranian thing is kind of interesting because it's not just sanctions. Um, I was in Iran in 2004. And uh, there was a big debate going on in Iran at that time over the contract structure and how to attract foreign capital. And Iran, uh, even before uh, the, uh, the uh, UN and uh, US and European sanctions uh, that are holding back Iranian production now, was struggling to attract capital to develop these oil resources. So uh, I, it, this is not just a sanction story. It's a, it's a question of how countries are able to organize uh, internally uh, how they develop uh, their resource base. Natural gas markets. The uh, reference case for the uh, 2013 International Energy Outlook, uh, as I said, uh, at least three times already has natural gas as the world's fastest growing fossil fuel. 1.7% uh, uh, growth rate uh, between now uh, and 2040. So this is how that uh, is split up uh, in the uh, OECD in blue and the non-OECD in uh, green again. In 2010, uh, you see about 60, a little less than 60 uh, trillion cubic feet each. Um, my uh, numbers crunching uh, side of my brain works better with billion cubic feet a day, and so we put that scale on the right-hand side. So there's a total 
uh, world gas um, uh, consumption in 2010 of about uh, 300 billion cubic feet. So to put that into perspective, current production and consumption in the U.S. is running in the neighborhood of, you know, with, with some Canadian imports, about 70 uh, billion cubic feet a day. So 300 billion cubic feet uh, world gas market. Uh, gas market in 2040 is going to be closer to 500 billion cubic feet. Instead of a 50-50 split, it's going to look more like 60-40 with 300 billion cubic feet in the non-OECD countries alone and 200 billion cubic feet uh, in the OECD. Uh, so in the non-OECD, we have consumption growing at 2.2 percent a year and about a 1 percent growth rate uh, for natural gas uh, in uh, the OECD countries. All right, so um, what about elsewhere in the world? The uh, largest production increases from uh, 2010 to 2040 occur in non-OECD Europe and Eurasia. And uh, it's hard for me to, to do this here, but if you um, kind of break that top line up, uh, Russia uh, and the U.S. both account for about 12 uh, billion cubic feet, or excuse me, uh, 12 uh, trillion cubic feet uh, in uh, 2040. This is the change, so growth. Uh, and the other, so the difference between 12 and 19 in that top line is everybody else. In the Middle East, the way that's divided up is Roughly, Iran grows five, Gutter grows five, and everybody else in the Middle East grows about five, and that gets you to that 16 uh, TCF change number. Uh, the U.S., as I said, is 12. So the United States and Russia uh, increase natural gas production uh, by about the same amount and account for nearly one-third of the total increment in natural gas uh, production. Uh, fairly big numbers from those two countries. Uh, electricity markets. Uh, electricity is the world's fastest growing fo form of end use energy consumption uh, in our reference case. World net electricity generation nearly doubles between 2010 and 2040. Uh, total net electricity generation in the non OECD countries uh, increases by a little over 3%, and, uh, and it's even faster than that in China. So looking uh, at this chart, uh, coal still provides the largest share of world electricity generation in 2040, although its share does decline from uh, about 40% in 2010 down to 36% uh, in uh, 2040. The liquid share of total generation uh, also falls in the reference case. Uh, we have relatively high oil prices um, in uh, the reference case. And um, that uh, tends to uh, limit uh, the uh, growth in uh, oil going into electricity, particularly in places uh, in the, in the non-OECD countries. Solar is the fastest growing component of renewable energy. Uh, nuclear's power, uh, nuclear power's share of generation increases from, and we don't have that on there because the numbers were going to get a little too small, from about 13% in 2010 to 14%, so share going up and actual uh, generation uh, rising uh, uh, fairly decently. Uh, I'll uh, come back to which countries uh, that we see uh, growing the fastest in nuclear in uh, in just a bit. In fact, let's just do that right now. Um, that top line is really pretty stunning. Uh, green, so the green color is 2010 and the blue color is 2040. So Chinese growth of uh, 150 gigawatts of nuclear uh, capacity uh, in the period between 2010 and 2040. Uh, growth uh, in um, OECD Europe, not so much. In the Americas, a uh, little other non-OECD, uh, fairly uh, decent there. Uh, the, the China story is an interesting one. Uh, it, it'll, it, this is going to 
this is going to be a reach <laughs> and a stretch, I think, for China uh, to do this and, and to manage it. Um, but uh, given the overall level of, of population uh, and given the need for electricity, uh, we think that this is, um, is our, you know, sort of, as I said, reference case view of where this is going. Uh, the full extent to which governments, uh, especially in Europe and Japan, uh, might withdraw their support uh, for nuclear power uh, remains uncertain. Uh, the German and Swiss governments have already announced uh, planned nuclear phase-outs. Uh, and Italy, there's been a countrywide referendum uh, that rejected uh, plans to build uh, new nuclear power plants. Uh, Turkey, Poland, and the UK have reiterated uh, plans for actually adding nuclear. Uh, France, we expect to continue uh, to rely fairly strongly on nuclear power, but even there, uh, in one of the nations that has the highest percentage of its electricity being delivered by uh, nuclear power, uh, there has uh, been a lot of popular opposition to the idea. So environmental concerns uh, seem to be being weighed differently against energy security uh, as people try to consider uh, where things are going on the nuclear side, and I think that that's pretty important. So we're getting pretty close to the end, and then we'll do some Q&A. Uh, I'm going to end up uh, talking a little bit about uh, carbon uh, dioxide uh, emissions that are uh, related to energy uh, consumption. Because of uh, rising GDP uh, in, in China, uh, rising population in India, uh, we're going to see a lot of growth in energy use. Uh, Non-OECD Asia is going to account for more than two-thirds of the world's increase in energy-related carbon dioxide emissions over the forecast period. Um, the continuing strong reliance on fossil fuels um, is uh, the, obviously, the driving factor in carbon dioxide emissions uh, that's going to occur globally, uh, especially in Asia. Uh, China's energy-related carbon dioxide emissions in 2010 uh, were already more than 40 percent of the U.S. number uh, higher uh, than those in the United States. And by 2040, uh, it will be close to twice uh, the level of U.S. emissions. If we look at this by fuels, uh, what we see is that coal is still uh, the most carbon intensive uh, fossil fuel contributing uh, to uh, carbon dioxide emissions. It, it was true in uh, 2010 and, uh, and continues to be in 2040. The natural gas share of carbon dioxide emissions remains relatively small by comparison. Uh, 19 percent, uh, if you go back to 1990, uh, at the beginning of, of the time frame in this graph, and it uh, holds at about 22 percent of total emissions in 2040. The uh, world's top three uh, national sources of coal-related emissions are China, the United States, and India, and it remains that way uh, throughout the forecast period. So. I'm going to close um, with uh, some comments on uncertainty in these forecasts. Uh, in, in some presentations that I give, I actually start off with a slide that says why we will be wrong. Because, <laughs> right? you know, if, if you think about this, uh, reference cases, particularly a reference case that's based on existing uh, law and regulation, uh, we know laws and regulations are going to change. We know technology is going to change. But we don't know when the technology is going to change. We don't know how rapidly it's going to change. We don't know about a lot of things. And I just want to highlight some of the things that, that uh, I believe will ultimately make a big difference in how these numbers work out. Uh, the long-term effects of economic uh, issues that we're seeing in the United States and Europe and even China uh, just over the last few weeks, for example, there have been increasing concerns raised about uh, how uh, the Chinese economy is performing and the possible movement of these short-term 
questions about the Chinese economy into the longer term, I think it's, it's, it's a realistic concern. Uh, the timing of Japan's uh, recovery in nuclear uh, after the uh, tragedy at Fukushima, uh, you know, we have forecast that we will see a return of a substantial portion of the nuclear power facilities in Japan. And uh, with the new government there, I think they are moving cautiously uh, in this direction. Uh, but the implications of how rapidly this happens, how much uh, you can bring back, has big implications for things like global natural gas markets uh, and, and other substitutes uh, for nuclear power in Japan. Uh, social unrest, uh, like we've seen over the past couple of years in the Middle East and North Africa, and the potential for unrest uh, elsewhere uh, could uh, make a big difference, not just on the supply side, but possibly even on the demand side. Uh, shale gas and shale oil production potential is another area that I think where things could really change. I know there are other forecasts out there that have much more aggressive uh, shale oil production growth rates than we're currently using at EIA, and of course that would make a difference. You know, one of the other things that we don't know is, well, what if we have further regulation of hydraulic fracturing? Because that's how um, shale gas and shale oil are being produced. And if uh, that regulation changes the cost structure enough, we might get less uh, than uh, some people believe. And so that's something uh, that, that, again, is, uh, is very difficult for EIA to put into its forecast. I highlighted uh, the issues that we see uh, potentially developing in terms of market share within OPEC between Saudi Arabia, uh, Iraq, and Iran. And then finally, uh, climate policies. Uh, we have uh, fairly substantial growth in CO2 emissions uh, built into our reference case forecast. And uh, just given uh, a lot of emphasis is being placed on climate initiatives uh, in Europe, uh, in the United States and, and globally, uh, it's certainly possible that that would change the landscape, either from a pricing or a regulatory uh, standpoint. And we, uh, we do have and have run some side cases uh, in uh, the, uh, the 2013 um, International Energy Outlook. So we have four alternative cases that examine sensitivity, mostly to GDP growth and oil prices. Uh, we have looked at carbon cases in, for the U.S. in the annual energy outlook, and I encourage you all uh, to take a look at, at the, uh, the AEO and other white papers that we've developed at uh, EIA on that issue. Uh, but we've looked at high economic growth cases, low economic growth cases, high oil prices, low oil prices, and so on. Uh, all of those things uh, lead to uncertainty, but uh, what I presented to you here today is our best shot at it with what we know now. So, uh, Dave, with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. It's a great presentation. Um, before we start the, the questioning, I was going to take the prerogative of being the moderator to actually you, hold on just a second. Yeah, I was rearranging that I was rearranging that stuff. Oh, I'm gonna was, I'm gonna rearrange <laughs> this too so that we I can see the people Adam, over. I can do this. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I love doing that. <laughs> Come on, sit here. <laughs> Adam's a hands on guy if you haven't seen him. Uh, I've I've always thought if you want it done, do it yourself. <laughs> Let's see if I can actually go backwards here a second. So you spent a long time in your career uh, working in a uh, banking environment where you would look at forecasts like this and then go to the people you worked with and say, okay, here's where I think it's going to diverge from that. So you gave us a nice list of things that will impact it, but you didn't really tell us which way it might go. So imagine <laughs> we're all here in your former, and I, I know you can't actually get totally out of your current environment, but you're in your former environment and you're advising people about, well, my gut tells me this is where things may go when markets given these uncertainty factors. Or is it very hard to tell because they counterbalance and what we get is a world of significant volatility over time rather than one where you can say, I, my gut tells me we're going to be on a lower trajectory for prices, a higher trajectory, et cetera. 
So we, we actually do uh, have tried. In fact, let me, I'm going to grab my papers off oh. here. On the, on the question of oil price trajectory, um, we have a high price case that actually gets up to $237 a barrel uh, in 2040 uh, in real terms. And the low oil price case is $75 a barrel in real terms. Our, our middle ground is, a, our middle ground is right head. <laughs> right, I watched, uh, I watched Guy Caruso, another uh, uh, fine contributor here to uh, the, the energy team at, at CSIS. I watched Guy get excoriated, I think, uh, one time up on, uh, you know, giving some testimony. You know, it, it's, it's hard um, for the public uh, to understand uh, why prices move around as quickly as they do. Uh, and uh, reference case forecasts, um, as I said, uh, are designed to try to help inf inform the, the, to create a base to make decisions around, uh, but they're not going to be a perfect forecasting tool. And, and so you, you come back to, like, the oil question or gasoline prices. Uh, one of the things that economists will tell you is, is that uh, both oil uh, production is, is very inelastic in the short term. It's hard to increase oil production uh, even with very sharp oil price increases. It's hard to curtail demand uh, in the short run with with sharp increases in oil prices. So all it takes is a little bit of, a, of an imbalance in global markets and those very steep um, price elasticity curves uh, work against you, both on the supply and demand side. And so the only way to rebalance markets when you have shortages, for example, losing a million and a half barrels a day of light, sweet crude oil from Libya, as happened you know, several years ago, uh, is to see uh, a sharp increase in prices. You need the price to go up to, to remove demand from the market and to encourage uh, producers to bring on more supply. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, it, that just took me about two minutes to explain that and the normal amount of the time that you have <laughs> at hearings is about 15 seconds. <laughs> Right? So we, 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 we're trying to build in something that we believe realistically captures the, the potential range. So your question was, how do we think that this would really move over time, um, you know, based on some of the uncertainties that are out there? Uh, I think that the possibility, uh, and, I, and I urge you all to read uh, the, the section on uh, Middle Eastern uh, OPEC production levels, that it's a very realistic possibility that over the next few years, uh, as non-OPEC production is rising and demand remains relatively flat, that we could see um, a, a possible um, flatness in oil prices or maybe even weakness based on uh, competition uh, for market share among uh, key OPEC member countries. The other thing, uh, so I, I would say, uh, Predicting, you know, where shortages could occur, though, uh, you know, unrest in, in any major producing country uh, or, or accidents uh, could drive prices up. Uh, I suspect that over the, the near term uh, that, that market forces are tending to drive prices down, but geopolitical actions probably are adding that, that upside. Uh, potential in the in the crude oil area. Okay. Um, so just a few ground rules on the Q&A session. If you can wait for the microphones to, to come to you, we've got people roving with microphones. If uh, you can introduce yourself and your affiliation and hopefully frame a question out of whatever statement you'd like to make, that would be useful. <laughs> so we'll take one right here in the front. Get the microphones open. Thank you. Uh, my name's Charlie Curtis. I'm retired, gratefully. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, Adam, is that, I don't know whether it's working. Can you hear Charlie? 
Okay. Can everybody? I, I see people. Yeah, now, now they can. <laughs> uh, just a question. Uh, did you do uh, or do you have available any um, uh, energy trade balances among nations arising out of this analysis? Uh, for example, um, the uh, China's uh, uh, forecasted uh, contribution to electricity production from nuclear, how does that affect China's oil import dependency, uh, particularly? Uh, so is, is there a forecast case that people can see where the trade flows are in in energy, in particular in f fossils. Right. So we don't have specific trade balance forecasts uh, in the uh, in the IEO, uh, but we uh, certainly do look at um, at import dependency. You know, you could calculate import dependency ratios from how much is being produced versus how much is being consumed. Uh, trade balance issues are, uh, are important. Um, China's import bill uh, for oil will be rising. And uh, interestingly, uh, given where we're going, at least certainly over the next you know, five to 10 years, the chances are pretty good that the U.S. import bill is going to decline substantially. We've already seen uh, U.S. Uh, oil uh, imports as a proportion of our uh, total oil demand uh, go down from like 60% in 2005 to uh, below 40% now, and we're continuing to, to drift lower on those numbers. Uh, we uh, are a net exporter of oil products. We're a net exporter of coal. Uh, we are uh, likely to be uh, in the AEO 2013 forecast, a net exporter of natural gas around the year 2020. And uh, although we don't have in our reference case the U.S. becoming a net exporter of oil, we did run a side case that said that it's possible, uh, given the right circumstances on both the resource side and the demand side, that uh, the U.S. could, uh, you know, go flat on uh, oil imports sometime after the year 2030. So why don't I start, I'll work my way across, across the room, because uh, I often don't uh, get to the wings. So why don't we start with one here, followed by a question in the back, so. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm Robert Lanza with ICF. Uh, you said earlier in your talk that Brazil needed to become more organized in order to meet projections. Is that just because pre-salt's difficult to produce, or were there other issues that you were referring to? Well, most of the issues, uh, so the, the question, uh, just to make sure everybody heard it, is the, the question uh, was, I had said that uh, Brazil's got some above ground issues. Uh, that's how I would answer that, is what's, what could possibly slow down Brazil's oil development? Uh, and. And the answer, uh, in almost all cases, when you look around the world, are not so much, you know, in, in the major oil uh, countries, it's not the resource uh, base so much as it is the above ground issues of what are the rules and regulations associated with oil production, uh, how easy is it to attract capital, um, and, uh, and so on. Brazil has been experimenting with local content laws uh, for drilling that I think have, uh, have slowed down uh, oil output uh, in Brazil and, uh, and other issues similar to that. Uh, it's not just Brazil. Uh, we uh, have, you know, many people have noted uh, that there are above ground issues with attracting capital in Mexico because of the constitutional ban on uh, foreign companies operating in Mexico. There are above ground issues uh, in producing shale gas uh, in Europe, uh, where countries uh, have uh, instituted uh, uh, bans on uh, the use of hydraulic fracturing uh, and so on. Uh, there are uh, lots of above ground issues uh, when you think about them that have to do with how strong uh, the uh, 
drilling companies are from a technology standpoint, um, how easy it is to uh, get access to land, um, you know, what the incentives are um, for the uh, company that's, that's uh, drilling and producing relative to the uh, landowner or royalty uh, holders and a host of other uh, issues like that. And uh, as a consequence, it, it just adds uncertainty uh, to all these numbers uh, for, for everybody, uh, not just any individual country. And I think there's a question in the back of that section. Yeah. Blake, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Blake Subject with Energy Wire. I just had a quick question about uh, uncertainties from the technological perspective. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of buzz lately about methane hydrates. I guess, what's your favorite <laughs> uh, technological uncertainty going forward toward 2040? <laughs> what's my favorite technological uncertainty? Um, well, I, you know, that's, that's actually kind of an interesting one. Maybe you could go through, you know, go through fuels. Um, it, you know, there's probably lots of different ways to cut that, but let me try to do it by going through fuels. For coal, I would say, uh, can we figure out some way to, to, um, to do uh, carbon sequestration? Uh, for natural gas, it might actually be that too, uh, but on the natural gas side, let's say that the uh, major technological question uh, will be um, how, uh, you know, how do we make sure that we properly manage uh, hydraulic fracturing? Um, and, and could technology play a role in that? I mean, there have been, uh, there's been an effort made, for example, to reduce the amount of water uh, that's needed to fracture wells. There's been an effort to move away from, to think of ways to do this that might not even use water at all. Uh, nuclear, uh, I would say there, uh, probably the most interesting thing would be, is there uh, going to be an opportunity for SMRs, small modular reactors, and could that, and, and waste disposal issues on the technology side, and would that uh, give a new um, boost to uh, nuclear power on a global basis? And for oil, um, I would say that the, the key technological question for oil is not so much in oil itself, but probably um, what would we see uh, on the technology side that would take oil's market share away in fuels? And that would be developments in electric batteries and uh, developments in technologies uh, that would allow natural gas to be more economically used in uh, transportation uh, like LNG, in heavy trucks and um, rail uh, locomotive applications, marine applications. So uh, interesting question. Thanks for that. Just a few uncertainties. Um, OK, so I'll take one here and one back. Well, OK, what, these three, three right here in the middle section we'll take in order. So why don't you go? He'll be Roger Humphreyville with BP. Your projection showed significant increase in biofuels production in the U.S. and in Brazil. Did the study look at how that will evolve in terms of conventional biofuels versus advanced lignocellulosic? Right. So the question was, we uh, do have growth in biofuels occurring uh, in the U.S. and Brazil. Uh, have we looked at uh, the split uh, between uh, conventional and and uh, newer technologies, cellulosic technologies we have. We've actually, uh, I think we've, when did we, uh, we have published um, or, or will shortly uh, publish a uh, fairly uh, sizable document uh, looking at, at, you know, I, I know, I know we've, we've looked at, at carbon and I think we've, we've done some stuff on, on, uh, <laughs> this is John John Conti. So yeah, so our detailed <laughs> <laughs> our detail pro close. Yep. Hello, hello. Yeah. yeah there. Our detailed projections for biofuels you can find our annual energy outlook. And it basically, you know, we go straight up to the corn limit in the RFS and then there's some additional advanced technologies and and it's unclear exactly 
you know, we have a forecast in there, which we've reduced a couple of times over the past few years. <coughs> right. Um, but we, ex we that intend to see cellulosic sure. ethanols and the like going forward to time. Maybe not the levels mandated in the RFS, but they're, they're, we expect them to penetrate that and other sources. For Brazil, we don't do the same detailed analysis we do for the AEO. However, um, we believe there'll be sufficient quantities of advanced, what we consider advanced in the United States, uh, cellul uh, uh, ethanol. I, I did testify uh, a couple of weeks ago on uh, renewable fuels issues, and one of the things uh, that, that we've said is that since the uh, renewable fuels um, law was passed, and I think it was 2007, uh, we've been, EIA has been arguing that the, the target for 36 billion uh, gallons of renewable fuels that was set for 2022 was going to be extremely difficult uh, to achieve. Uh, I think we started off saying difficult, and then we went to extremely difficult. And I believe uh, what I said two weeks ago was impossible. <laughs> so um, it, it's the, the technology is not developed as rapidly as many people were expecting. And the number of advanced biofuels plants that have been built really uh, got slowed down very dramatically by the 2008-2009 recession. Uh, and uh, so we're seeing a couple of startups just recently, and we'll have to see how all of that works out. Uh, but uh, it, it'll be, you know, there's, there, it's coming, but it's coming slower and at lower volumes than were originally anticipated by most of the people, I think, who were looking at this. So there's a question here in the front, and then we'll take one in the back. Thank you. My name is Hasmuk Shah from Business Times. As we understand, the Obama administration has given top priority to the energy security, which is reflected in recent trade missions of the Secretary John Kerry's mission to India last month on strategic dialogue. And just two days back, Vice President Joe Biden's meeting also with the Indian Prime Minister, other things. Energy security was the top topic of the discussion. So India also looks for the energy security. And in two areas, there are tremendous opportunities of cooperation, shale gas supply, as well as nuclear energy. But there are certain constraints and constraints with both the issues. So Mr. Siminski, can you highlight about this? What is the status? Because President Obama has agreed to forego the, to about the free trade agreement is not in India, but still we are prepared to supply the natural uh, shale gas to India. So what is the latest situation on these two points? Thank right, so I, I, that question had to do with uh, with energy security and uh, three state agreement on nuclear activities. Uh, that's really beyond the scope of of EIA. You you mentioned the secretary, but you said Secretary Kerry. He's at the State Department. <laughs> I'm at the Energy Department, and. Um, we do have people working on nuclear power issues, but it's mainly um, from the standpoint of existing law and regulation, and so I really don't have a comment on that. I, I, do, uh, I do think that, that you're highlighting something that, that is extremely critical, uh, and uh, there, there's something that, that I think it used to be called the CSIS triangle of energy security, <laughs> the economy, and the environment. Right? And, and I like to think of it more along the lines of, uh, you know, for those uh, engineers out there, a Venn diagram. So a Venn diagram is circles. And it's three overlapping circles and this, the, in the middle. If you thought of these overlapping circles of energy security, which you asked about the environment and the economy, is that energy policies, the, the sweet spot is that middle part where it's, it's, if you do something that it's good for energy security, it's good for the environment, and uh, it's, uh, it's good for the economy. And 
I, I think that we used to believe, and I, I think that many people still do, uh, that natural gas kind of fits nicely uh, in, into that, that sweet spot as an example. Uh, but uh, it's very difficult. There are lots of things that, that get done for energy security reasons that have environmental or economic consequences, and, and, it, and it works around that chain. Uh, but highlighting energy security issues, I think, is uh, is an important thing. And on the nuclear side, uh, finding ways to to have low or no carbon uh, energy growth, uh, nuclear and and uh, uh, renewables, uh, still uh, I think very important. And um, managing the security aspects around all of that uh, also very important. So a question there. Adam Siegel, I run the Energy Security Program at Insight Through Analysis. First of all, thank you very much. I love thinking in the Venn diagram very much, so I appreciate your, your visualization, your words to provide the visualization. Uh, one of the strengths and weaknesses of a baseline case, scenario reference case, is it's using government policy, obviously U.S., but how do we apply this worldwide? One of the numbers jumps out to me. The Chinese, I think it's in the five-year plan, say they're going to peak coal in 2015, yet they, what this is saying is a peak in 2030 time frame that has huge implications, uh, carbon and otherwise. The Chinese government says they're peaking in three to four years and many of the purchases of technology that I'm tracking go right with that, yet you're saying they're not gonna peak for another 15 years after that. You know, I keep turning this mic off and I have to learn to just leave it on. <laughs> I'm hoping somebody else will answer that question. That's why I turned <laughs> my mic off. <laughs> Uh, well, how do we do um, evolving rules and regulations in other countries? It's hard enough for us to deal with that here in the U.S. It's, it's increasingly, you know, problematic as you move out into to other countries. And uh, we, I, I suspect that what we're doing is kind of relying more on existing trends uh, and, and a slower move. Uh, in things like that, uh, just based on how we are seeing those numbers develop. Uh, we do have a number of people uh, here uh, from EIA, and why don't you come up and grab, uh, you know, Sam Napolitano or John Conte afterwards, and we'll get one of our uh, coal experts or China experts uh, to, uh, to look into that. Um, Candace Dunn on our staff, who I don't think made it over here, is Mike, Mike, where are you? Do you want to answer this question, Mike? Go ahead, take the, take the microphone. <laughs> yeah, we, is that, is that working? Yeah. Yep. I mean, we do look at it, but I think it's just, we must have higher energy demands and that sort of thing that, you know, really kind of keep us from seeing that kind of five-year plan for China. I know we've, we've kind of looked at it, and it's kind of hard for us to decipher how they're really going to be able to do that, given that, you know, the, the economic growth they have and the demand growth that we're seeing for China. Uh, So the, the, the point that was made was that when you do a reference case based on existing law and regulation, uh, that you might end up, um, you know, missing uh, the, the trend. So the way we try to address that is in these alternative cases. Uh, we didn't do as many alternative cases for the IEO as we do in, for the U.S. and the AEO, but in the U.S., for example, we, we do look at uh, different uh, cases uh, like for carbon uh, fees, uh, that was a big part of the, the AEO, and that makes a huge difference. I mean, just in the U.S., and I can speak to those numbers, something like a $15 uh, a, uh, a metric ton uh, charge fee uh, or the equivalent thereof uh, over the time frame out to 2035 or 2040, makes an enormous difference in, in what the fuel structure for electric uh, generation looks like. 
Uh, you get uh, less of the carbon intensive fuels, coal for example, and more of the less carbon intensive fuels, uh, a little bit more uh, natural gas for example, and a lot more nuclear. And uh, I, I agree with you uh, that it's important and that's why we try to do the side cases. The problem uh, that we always run into is, is that the more side cases we do, the longer it takes to do the study, the more complicated it gets, the more tables there are in the back. And, um, and so we try to highlight uh, what we think are important in the side cases, uh, but we can't, we can't do it all. Uh, but I think that the, the, the question you've raised is, is a, a good one. And, I think China in general, I mean, when you look at China in these numbers, uh, the economic growth that's occurring there uh, is, uh, is stunning. Uh, that is fantastic in terms of the number of people who have been lifted out of poverty. Uh, on the other hand, it has consequences uh, for both energy and the environment that, that uh, are um, significant. And uh, the data from China to allow us to, to make a lot of these assessments is very difficult. Um, there are uh, lots of issues associated with uh, th simple things like what's the level of coal reserves in China and you know, will, uh, will coal reserves uh, uh, move China uh, towards other fuels, uh, not just the, you know, or, or the lack thereof, uh, you know, move China. Uh, so we don't really quite think so, but it's an issue. Uh, some of the other things that, that come up in, in, at least as far as the oil area is concerned, is the lack of a lot of data once you get outside of the U.S., Japan, Germany, and, and a few of the other OECD countries on oil inventories. We don't know what oil inventory uh, pictures look like in a lot of countries, and I think it's critically important to understanding uh, world oil supply and demand balances, and we just don't have that data. I don't have it from, uh, from China, don't have it from a number of other countries, uh, including Russia uh, and others, and it makes it very, very difficult. You know, and that ends up why we have this big range you know, in our, our oil price forecasts. I, I, I would add, uh, Adam, that one of the reasons we're very glad to see the IEO come back is that it, it does carry on this tradition of trying to look at forecasts without doing policy overlays. And, in contrast to the decision that the IEA made with the WIO to, to highlight a set of policies that they assume will happen, which you, the, you then have to understand better. So I think that's one reason we're really glad that you made the decision to, to go back to publishing that. So question here and then one over there. Uh, Greg Miller, Georgetown University. Um, in your, one of the uncertainty factors that you highlighted in your uh, forecast here was climate policies. but to what extent did your projections kind of take into account changes in the climate itself, such as rivers drying up and affecting hydro or droughts affecting agriculture and therefore biofuels or storms and flooding affecting coastal production or refining uh, capacities? <laughs> right, so did we look at the impacts of, of changes in weather um, floods, uh, forest fires, uh, ocean level, you know, increases, temperature changes, uh, and the answer is no. <laughs> um, I had a related actual question. So for about CO2, you have CO2 emission projections, okay? My question is if those numbers are plugged into some climate models, whatever they are, what, when, we, when would the temperature increase by 2 degrees, 4 degrees, et cetera? Specifically, I think there was a paper saying like, when we reach cumulative CO2 emissions, one trillion metric ton, you know, cumulative, that's when we get two degrees Celsius. So the question is, when we're gonna, by which year we're gonna reach trillion metric ton emission total? Which year, do you, can you estimate? So the, the question, wait, I need a piece of tape on yes. this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can move my papers up there, so then I won't see that red button. So the question is, what's the, Annual growth in in CO2 emissions. Right. Are we trying to? Is EIA trying to relate CO2 emissions to temperature? No. <laughs> I mean, that's we're not climate scientists at EIA, and there are plenty of other parts of the the government, EPA, 
uh, the United Nations and elsewhere uh, who are, you know, making a strong effort at, at trying to understand those relationships, but we're not, we're sticking to the energy side. I, I want to come back uh, to the issue of, you know, are we thinking all, at all about uh, floods, forest fires, hurricanes, um, and so on at EIA? And yes, we are, uh, at least for the United States. Uh, we have dramatically, over the past year, improved our mapping capabilities, and I urge you to go to the EIA website and look at our uh, mapping systems. Just recently, we've added uh, to our mapping that can get down to the county level uh, on a lot of things um, in terms of energy facilities, you know, where the resources are, where resources and reserves, where the production facilities are, where power plants are, transmit all these things. Uh, that that uh, that we can show to the detail that's allowed uh, by Homeland Security, and there's plenty of that in there uh, that you can look at. We have map overlays, and one of the things that we just added is the the a, a direct feed from NOAA on hurricanes. So if you want to, when a hurricane comes in, you can see where that's headed towards production facilities or uh, electric power uh, plants and and that kind of thing. Uh, we are, uh, I think we're in a beta stage with an overlay that shows where fo forest fires are around the country and how that might impact uh, electric transmission lines. Uh, we're looking at, uh, at storm surge levels and adding a layer in for storm surge uh, levels. This is in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, so we are looking at that uh, for, the, for the U.S., uh, not so much from the standpoint of attempting to predict uh, any of those things. That's not going to be possible, uh, but certainly trying to understand what the impact would be on our energy infrastructure is something that, uh, that we're taking pretty seriously and doing a lot of work on. Okay. A question here. I didn't see anything out to the far right there, so. Uh, Hi. Oh, okay, uh, go ahead. Mark, you can wait. What, if you don't mind Sorry. waiting one second, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't. No, know. that's okay. I was, you're in the same line of point. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt Haldane, Reuters. I uh, was wondering about um, what you think, uh, if there are any implications for, for the data you're putting out, what you think the Im implications are on public policy, whether that, uh, in, here in the U.S., whether that's related to climate change or um, uh, global trade and exports and, and how that will impact uh, relations with countries like China and India. Ah, it goes off on its own. I'm not doing it. Okay. That makes me feel better. Uh, uh, you know, I wonder why does that go off. Um, I, I think my reply to that one is going to be very similar to uh, the, the question on um, nuclear uh, security. Uh, that's really uh, something that's in the, the, uh, the State Department and, uh, and is not really an EIA uh, issue. Thank you. N Nilesh Nurikar from the... <laughs> <laughs> We, there are people from the State Department that are here, and, we, and you can come up afterwards and talk to them. <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. I was just waiting to see if Neelish would duck under his chair. Right <laughs> Mark Finley with BP. Uh, it says yeah. we're an equal opportunity employer here at EIA. I'll direct <laughs> questions to all of the various departments. That <laughs> I'd like to just, uh, thank you for an invaluable service that you and, 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 you know, and, and the dedicated team at EIA provide with this uh, outlook. Uh, so thank you, first of all. Um, you, you mentioned transportation as an uncertainty for oil. Um, you mentioned the potential for batteries and for natural gas and transport. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you actually see in your base case uh, in that regard. I mean, does oil keep its monopoly in transport? Um, right. Who wants to answer that question? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you want, they, you want me to answer that question. Right, so, uh, the, you know, I actually have read this entire study, <laughs> uh, but I haven't memorized it all yet. Uh, there, there are, you know, you will be able to get into some of that detail in the tables, 
Um, will oil, oil is, is clearly going to maintain a very strong market share uh, in transportation. I think uh, EIA has actually um, said, and we did so in the AEO, so this is, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to give you a lot of detail on what's going to happen internationally, but I, we could 94 percent of that. Right. So pretty slow penetration of electric vehicles. And I'll bet you anything that of that six, six percent remaining, that five percent of it is is uh, uh, gas electric hybrids rather than all battery vehicles and, um, you know, all electric. So one of the things that that we will have in the 2014 annual energy outlook. And one of the things uh, that we will be doing, uh, look, everybody is under uh, budget pressure. And, and I'm not just talking about the EIA or uh, federal agencies, but, you know, households. Uh, you know, the, the drop in the economic activity that we saw in 2008 and 2009 uh, is still reverberating across the economy in terms of of how much money people have in their pocket to spend. And, uh, and it's true for EIA as, as well as, as it is for people that uh, have been hit very hard by high gasoline prices, just as an example. So what are we trying to do internally to deal with this uh, at EIA? And one of the things that John Conti and his team came up with was that uh, we could try to do alternating years, so a light and regular uh, year for the AEO and the IEO. And so next year we're going to institute the first year where we're going to do a full AEO, but a smaller version. We'll update the tables and particularly the petroleum side of the international energy outlook. Uh, and then in 2015, we'll do a scaled back version of the U.S. outlook and, and get back to a fuller version of the international outlook. So let me come back and and, and address at least part of your question uh, from a U.S. perspective. Uh, one of the things that I'm pretty sure that will be different in the 2015-14 uh, AEO uh, in the U.S. is greater penetration of natural gas into transportation. And I suspect that it's, it's going to be mostly LNG. We are seeing a lot of experimentation uh, going on right now uh, in uh, uh, LNG into heavy-duty trucking, LNG into rail transport. Several railroads are this year experimenting with LNG uh, as a fuel to drive what they used to call diesel electric engines, diesel fuel, you know, powering generators to make electricity. And it's very easy to convert a diesel engine to run on natural gas, and the railroads are experimenting, experimenting with this. And I do know that there are some... Uh, 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 freighters uh, that ply the intercoastal U.S. trade that are under construction in uh, Louisiana that are going to run on LNG. Uh, they, they will probably be dual fueled capable of doing both uh, uh, marine fuel and uh, but LNG as well. And, uh, and I think that that is something uh, that we missed out on in the AEO 2013, but we're going to capture uh, that development development uh, looking out. Uh, one thing that I think we've learned, Mark, across all fuels, all technologies, is that that uh, things take a long time. Uh, even shale, which everybody says, "Wow, this you know this miracle happened in the last five years." Well, it's become very apparent in the last five years. But the the technology for uh, doing horizontal drilling and 3D seismic and, and hydraulic fracturing uh, has been worked on uh, by uh, both government uh, and industry uh, people all the way back into the, the late 1980s, early 1990s. And so it's really the, the cycle, even for things like shale gas, which we think is just so recent, is really a lot longer thing. And so I think that that slows these penetration rates down quite a bit. So we've got time, I think, for maybe uh, uh, two more questions. So if I see any. Wow, oh, wow. we'll, we'll end think, ahead of time. Um, <laughs> well, let me, let me follow up a little bit on the, the nuclear side. And I know you probably don't want to go back there again. So one, nah. sort of one last question. Um, you're showing 
you know, the, the aggressive China growth, which I, I think uh, everyone expects, but you're also showing some significant growth in uh, the, um, the Americas as such. And looking at where the U.S. nuclear industry is going, it looks like we're perhaps not even building more and perhaps we're declining. So I was wondering where this growth may be happening. Are you seeing in, the, in Latin America, Canada, someplace? Yeah, I think we're, we're expecting uh, Brazil uh, to grow nuclear, uh, even in the U.S. Uh, our forecast suggests slight growth in uh, nuclear output in the U.S. that, uh, that we will build, uh, build a few uh, new nuclear power facilities, so uh, existing technology, and, um, and that uh, retirements uh, will be more than offset by the, the additional plants and up rates uh, to some of the existing plants, and so that we'll actually have greater uh, nuclear generation in, in the U.S. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a combination of the U.S. and a few of the uh, countries in Latin America. I don't know whether we, I don't, I'm not sure what we have in for Canada, uh, but I suspect that uh, some of those numbers. Three in, uh, in which country? In Canada. So three gigawatts in Canada, and and uh, sound about right. <laughs> so okay. Um, well, um, I think Adam, we've oh we've got one last question, so. or a comment. Oh. It's Ayaka Jones from EIA. So Ayaka. Oh, sorry. Did you want to talk um, about coal too? Yeah, may I try to answer <laughs> that question on China? That gentleman's question. Yeah. So there are a few points. First of all. The five-year plan is not binding. I don't think on the coal target historically, like in the past few years, 2008, they have surpassed the 2008 or 2010, not quite sure. They have passed the, the target that the government set. And second of all, I'm not sure if uh, uh, the five-year plan really means that the peak coal in, by 2015. Um, maybe the five years they said they will cap coal, but going forward after the, this 12th, to 5th year, what's happened, I don't think it's uh, clear. And uh, third of all, based on our projection for coal consumption is based on our GDP outlook and result in the power demand outlook. And we, in that supply mix of electricity, we already built in very aggressive nuclear plant, as you can see. Uh, the slides uh, Adam just show, and we are also building hydro uh, development. The only wild card is natural gas. Uh, we've built in a reasonable story we think um, might, may work given the above ground issues for unconventional gas development. Um, if, uh, you know, that's, a, that's the only wild card for coal consumption to peak by 2015, natural gas have to take off by 2015, I don't think, and unconventional natural gas have to take off that early, which we don't think that's reasonable. So, yeah. Uh, thanks. thanks, Yaka. Um, so actually, that reminds me of, of uh, a couple of things that I, I wanted to say. So uh, the last point uh, of the three that Yaka made was the uncertainty surrounding coal, uh, excuse me, natural gas in China, and I talked about a lot of these above ground issues. Uh, it's not a below ground issue, and this comes from uh, EIA's uh, report on global oil and shale gas resources. And you see that China, uh, uh, according to, to uh, our numbers and numbers from ARI, Advanced Resources International, has an abundance of shale gas resources, so the possibility that some of that could be developed uh, is very strong. I think it's kind of interesting that you also see on the gas side Argentina, Algeria, uh, and, uh, and of course Canada, but even Mexico. So we're back to, you know, if, the, if Mexico can deal uh, with some of the above ground issues that they have, uh, the potential for development of gas resources there is very strong. On the left hand side, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that Russian oil production, we expect, will actually be higher in 2040 than it is now. Uh, the Russians have a lot of uh, potential shale oil, uh, again, even bigger than our estimate uh, for the U.S. And there's uh, shale resources, uh, oil resources in China, Argentina, and Libya as well. And so all of that uh, creates uncertainty. The second point that I wanted to make, and I'm really pleased that you jumped in uh, on that, is one of the things that I found 
uh, since uh, arriving at EIA uh, a year ago in June uh, is the unbelievable number of smart, dedicated uh, public servants. Charlie Curtis and I were talking about public service uh, here in Washington, and uh, um, I feel myself choking up a little about this. <laughs> um, EIA is chock full of people who really want to be accurate, objective, and relevant. And we're trying real hard to do that. Thank you. Well, I think with that, Adam, uh, I just let me thank you very much for taking the time out to come and do this presentation. It's really great to have you back here. And I promise the next time you come for a public session in our new building, it won't be this cold. So thank you very much. <laughs>